So uh, let's get started talking about the, um, the Eichmann trial. Okay, first of all, a little words about the uh, man himself. So Adolf Eichmann, who was he? 1932, he joined the Nazi party. Uh, he really made a name or made an infamous name for himself in 1938 when the Germans invaded uh, Austria and he was there in Vienna already um, expropriating Jewish uh, property for the SS. Um, he, in uh, January 1942, he was at the infamous uh, Wannsee conference, which decided on the final solution for the Jewish problem. And he played a, a central role in that final solution. So he was not the architect of the final solution. He was, think of him as the administrator. And his name um, frequently, pro when um, uh, the Nuremberg trials were held after the, after the war, Eichmann's name was frequently mentioned. Um, in um, what happened to him after the war, he was actually captured by the Allies. Uh, he managed to escape from the uh, prison camp where he was held and with the help of uh, a church official he made his way to Argentina where he lived uh, in the 1950s. In 1957 Fritz Bauer who was a, a regional legal prosecutor in West Germany approached representatives of the Jewish agency. Remember at that time 1957 there were no official relations between the state of Israel and West Germany. But Fritz Bauer came to the Jewish agency with information on Eichmann's whereabouts. The information was passed on to the Mossad but the Mossad decided to do nothing with it. And um, really that very much summed up um, Israel's policy on war criminals from 1945 until 1960. Israel did very little to pursue uh, war criminals, basically because there were, there were a variety of reasons, but the main reason was Israel had its hands full just trying to survive and running around the world um, um, assassinating old war criminals was definitely not a priority for the state of Israel. Nonetheless, in 1959, when Bauer came back to, um, he came to Israel actually, and he met with Issa Harel, who was head of the Mossad, and he came this time, he was, uh, came with actually Eichmann's um, name, what, and what name he was living in Argentina, and also his address. And this time, Issa Harel felt that the information was sufficiently important that he would have to approach the Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, and let Ben-Gurion decide what to do with Eichmann. And Ben-Gurion famously decided or made the historic decision to bring Eichmann to Israel to stand trial. Okay, so the um, abduction of Eichmann is very, very well documented. There's a, a film on, uh, you can watch it on Netflix now. It's not a great film, but um, okay, you can see how he was abducted by the Mossad. Um, he was living under the name Ricardo Clement. And he was living as a, a, a he was a low-level foreman working at a Mercedes-Benz plant. Um, he was ambushed on May the 11th, 1961, by Mossad, Mossad operatives who waited for him um, on Gary Baldy Street where he lived. They waited for him to return from work. They bundled him into the back of a car. And um, famously, um, Eichmann said the words when he heard his abductor speaking Hebrew, he understood that he'd been abducted by Israelis. And he said the words, Bereshit bara elokim et ha-shamayim to show his kidnappers that he could understand Hebrew. Um, Eichmann was held in a safe house for about um, a week and um, he signed a statement. He was held, he was drugged a lot of the time, but he signed a statement that he was prepared to stand trial in Israel. And probably um, he was forced to sign that statement, but anyway, he signed it. And um, he was taken back to Israel disguised as part of an El Al crew. So there was, um, Argentina celebrated its independence, Independence Day, Abba Eben came to represent the state of Israel. And um, Abba Eben had to find his own way back to Israel. Afterwards, Eichmann was dressed up in an El Al uniform and um, he was put on board the El Al um, um, plane and taken back to Israel. And on May 23rd, 1960, Ben Gurion stood up before the Knesset and told the members of the Knesset, it is my duty to inform you that a short time ago, the security services apprehended one of the most infamous Nazi criminals, Adolf Eichmann. 
who was responsible together with the Nazi leadership for what they called the final solution to the Jewish problem. Adolf Eichmann is already imprisoned in this country and will soon be brought to trial. And the members of the Knesset stood and spontaneously, every member of the Knesset applauded Ben-Gurion's announcement. So why did Ben-Gurion orchestrate straight the trial? I already said that until the Eichmann, until they found out where Eichmann was, chasing war criminals was left to people like uh, Simon Wiesenthal and the Israeli government really didn't have any, any interest in it. So why did they want to bring Eichmann back to Israel? So a few reasons, justice, these were reasons actually people, I asked the question this afternoon, all kinds of people came up with um, various uh, answers. Justice, revenge, but Ben-Gurion wasn't really interested too much in revenge. And Ben-Gurion certainly wasn't interested in Eichmann the man. He had no interest in, in, in actual Eichmann. But what he did want to do, he, he did want to correct the image of the um, German or the, sorry, the European Jew who'd survived the Holocaust. He wanted to correct the image of lambs to the slaughter, which Israelis still had. 1% of Israelis had died in the War of Independence and they could not understand how Jews had meekly got on, left the houses, got on trains, gone, went to a concentration camp and walked into the gas chambers. It was a chance for survivors to tell their stories and confront their memories. And also Ben-Gurion was aware that it would remind the world to support the Jewish state to support the Jewish state that was surrounded by Arabs who openly declared that they wanted to annihilate the state and drive the Jews into the sea, and to remind the world that um, it was their duty to support the Jewish state so there would be no repeat of the Holocaust. And he also wanted the lessons of the Holocaust to filter down onto the uh, younger generation because all the memories of the survivors had been bottled up for, from 1945 until 1960. Um, one maybe um, cynical reason was that it, was, it, it has been suggested that it was a chance for Mapai to expound historical guilt, which was twofold. First of all, guilt that they didn't do enough. Ben-Gurion and the uh, members of the Yishuv did not do enough to save European Jewry from the Nazis. And also, to remove stains of collaboration. For example, we, we talked several weeks ago about Kastner, who was um, an Israeli, who was a, um, sorry, pre, um, he was an Israeli minister in the 1950s, but pre-state, he was involved in negotiations, not just with the Nazis, to release Jews in return for money. He was involved in negotiations with Adolf Eichmann. Okay, so Eichmann was taken into captivity. He was held in prison in the Agor. And um, two questions. First of all, how do we try him? And what charges do we uh, lay against him? So the, um, the, the latter one was, some, was, was, was easier to deal with. In 1950, the Knesset had passed the Nazi and Nazi collaborators law. By the way, it was always thought that this law would be used against capos, against Jewish collaborators. And it wasn't envisaged in 1950 to bring um, war criminals to Israel to stand um, in the dock. Um, so under this um, law, it was decided to charge Eichmann with crimes against humanity, with war crimes, with crimes against the Jewish people and membership in the criminal organization, which was the SS. There were also logistic problems. Where was the state going to try him? So he should have stood trial in the Jerusalem District Court, which was located in the Russian compound. It was a small court and um, Ben-Gurion realized that this was going to be a show trial and report. He wanted reporters to come from all over the world and be present at the trial and the court was, was completely unsuitable for that. So he um, took his uh, go-to man who was Teddy Collop and Teddy Collop found a more suitable uh, venue which was the um, ben Ha'am, which is a convention center. It's now called Jared Bahar Center in Jerusalem. And it, it actually wasn't finished um, at the time that Eichmann was brought to Israel, but Teddy Collett was um, told by the builders that it would be ready in time for the trial. And amazingly, it actually was. 
1960, Israel did not have television. So um, they contracted with the Capital Cities Broadcasting, which was an American company who videotaped the uh, trial. And Israelis, there was a simultaneous translation. A lot of the trial was conducted in German. And um, Israelis got access, could see, the, could see the trial. They went to movie theaters and they saw movie reels of the trial and they could listen to the trial on the radio. The judges. So um, there was also controversy in choosing the judges. So as I mentioned, the trial was to be held by the uh, Jerusalem District Court. The head of the, the, the court was Binyamin Halevi. But Binyamin Halevi in the Kassner trial, which was um, held in the early 50s, he had um, stated to Kassner, who was the Israeli minister who was involved in Eskema Havara, he had stated that Kassner had sold his soul to the devil, to Satan. And who was the Satan? I mentioned he did the deal with Eichmann. So how could Halevi possibly try Eichmann now? So Halevi was summoned to the Supreme Court and the president of the Supreme Court asked Halevi to recluse himself and Halevi categorically um, refused. So the Supreme Court decided to get around this problem by um, um, uh, deciding that it wouldn't, that, that the trial actually wouldn't be held by the district, Jerusalem District Court. It would be held by a panel and one judge would be from the Supreme Court, one judge would be from the Jerusalem District Court, and one judge would be from um, another district court, in this case, um, Tel Aviv. So Moshe Landa was the judge from the Supreme Court, Yitzhak Raver was the uh, judge from the Tel Aviv Court, and um, Binyamin Halevi, as head of the Jerusalem Court, decided that he would be the re representative of the Jerusalem Court. And uh, despite the fact that um, objections could be uh, raised by the defense against him sitting as one of the three judges. By the way, all the three judges were German born. There was also a problem regarding the defense. It was thought that no defense lawyer would want to defend Eichmann. So the Knesset passed a law which allowed, in exceptional circumstances, allowed for um, a foreign lawyer to represent Eichmann. And the um, lawyer that represented Eichmann was Robert Savatias, who was uh, a lawyer that was, um, he actually defended some of the Nazis in the uh, Nuremberg trial that took place after the Second World War. And all his fees, fees were paid by the Israeli government. For the prosecution, it was the job of the new Attorney General, Gidon Hausner, to decide who would prosecute the case. Um, in those days, the Attorney General was very friendly with the Prime Minister. Hausner was not a criminal lawyer, but um, somewhat surprisingly, he had decided that he was going to appoint himself to prosecute. And he very much shared Ben-Gurion's goals for the trial. So for six weeks, he isolated himself in the Sharon Hotel in Herzliya. He was delivered carful loads of um, <coughs> documents from many of the documents from the Nuremberg trial, documents from Yad Vashem, and um, documents, although he had to wade through them, documents was the easy part of his job because it was clear to him straight out that he could submit, just, he could just submit the documents from the Nuremberg trial and that would be enough to secure um, Eichmann's conviction. However, he decided that um, he would use, as Ben-Gurion wanted, he would use the trial to tell the story of the Shoah. And to do this, he would use, he would call 128 witnesses, of which many were survivors, who they would tell the story of the Holocaust, despite the fact that Eichmann wasn't directly connected to various parts of the Holocaust, and despite the danger of emotional um, testimony, the witnesses whose memory was um, perhaps not 100%, that was affected by trauma and the fact that the um, defense counsel could uh, um, also uh, challenge their testimony. Um, he also had a decision to make whether to focus specifically on Eichmann's actions, which would be relatively easy to um, secure a conviction or to um, broaden at the uh, trial and describe the Holocaust. And obviously he decided to do the, the latter. He showed um, at least his opening address to Ben-Gurion. Ben-Gurion didn't even read it. The only change that Ben-Gurion made was to remove references to West Germany and to replace that 
with the words Nazi Germany because Ben Gurion did not want to um, offend the German Chancellor and particularly to offend the West Germans at a time that relations between West Germany and Israel were, were becoming increasingly important. So um, the trial starts in 1961. The first week is immensely boring. There are loads of preliminary arguments in which the defense tries to challenge the um, jurisdiction, jurisdiction of the courts. And they had good reason to do that. They had a good basis because after all, the Mossad had gone into a foreign country and had abducted a foreign national and drugged him up and brought him back to Israel. Nonetheless, the trial proceeds and um, Hausman's opening words are as follows. When I stand before you here, judges of Israel, to lead the prosecution of Adolf Eichmann, I am not standing alone. With me are six million accusers, but they cannot rise to their feet and point an accusing finger towards him who sits in the dock and cry, I accuse, for their ashes are piled up on the hills of Auschwitz and in the fields of Treblinka and are strewn in, strewn in the forests of Poland. Their graves are scattered throughout the length and breadth of Europe. Their blood cries out, but their voice is not heard. <clears throat> the witnesses um, tell their stories, even though the judges say straight out that they will decide based on documentation and not on the witnesses on the Hausner calls. The judges even challenge the relevance of um, lots of the witnesses' testimony, but once they are on the stand, it's impossible to, um, it's impossible to interrupt them telling their story. And Hausner continues with his parade of witnesses, and he very much understood the significance of individual survivors of the Holocaust. And he actually encouraged survivors to tell their individual stories that um, were sealed within their memories. And somehow he redeemed them and also an entire generation of survivors. Um, for the first time, as I mentioned, for the first time, Israelis actually could see and they could hear stories of the Holocaust being told by survivors. And this became very much a watershed trial. It was the time that all those terrible memories that were locked in the, in, in, inside the survivors, it actually came out for young Israelis to see. I just want to show you the testimony of one survivor, Yechil Dinor. He was a writer and he was at Auschwitz for two years. He describes in his testimony the um, outer plane of Auschwitz, Auschwitz not being in this world at all. You'll see Dinor, you'll see um, Hausner, look how Hausner stands with his, with his head down, and also you will also see in, uh, you'll also be able to see Eichmann as well. Zohi Chronika Metoch Haplaneta Auschwitz Haiti Sham Berg Schnatayim Ein Hasman Sham Kifisha Hu כאן, על הכדור הארץ. כל שבר רגע הולך שם על גלגלי זמן אחר. לתושבי פלנטה זאת לא היו שמות. היו להם הורים ולא היו להם ילדים. הם לא... אוקיי, אני אסקיפ אביט. דינור שווה את הקורט, האחרונה שלהם שהם היו באושוויץ, שזה היה הטאטו על הארץ. הוא גם שווה את הפרסומים שהוא היה שווה. 
and I just play a little bit more now of uh, his testimony. <laughs> אחרי זמן, זמנו של אושוויץ, שנתיים, בהיותי מוזלמן, לעבור ארצות, כי הם הלכו ממני, תמיד הלכו ממני, נפרדו ממני, ובמבט עינינו הייתה השבועה הזאת. קרוב לשנתיים ימים הלכו ממני, ותמיד השאירו אותי אחריהם. אני רואה אותם, הם מסתכלים בי, אני רואה אותם, אני ראיתי אותם אולי תרשה לי מר דינור, אני אציג לך מספר שאלות אם טוב הדבר בעיניך. אני זוכר... לא, מר דינור, תשמע מה שאמר היועץ המשפטי. רגע אחד, תשמע עכשיו לי. לא, מר דינור. שקט, שקט, שקט. תשבו במקומכם בבקשה, אני מבקש מאוד, כן? כל אחד יושב במקומו. אוקיי, אז אתם יכולים לראות את התשובה המלאה, אם אתם רוצים לראות את זה, אתם יכולים לראות את זה ביוטיוב. אתם יכולים לראות את התשובה המלאה, הפרוסקוטור מנסה לשאול את השאלה, המשפט מנסה להתערבת, ודינור מנסה להתערבת. faints and has to be taken out of court and uh, never resumed his uh, evidence. Okay, Eichmann's defense, so the, the prosecution goes on for, for a long time. Eichmann's defense is much shorter. Um, the potential defense witnesses who are SS officers, surprisingly or not surprisingly, don't really want to come to uh, Israel to give evidence on Eichmann's behalf, particularly since the state does, gives no assurance that if they do come, they won't be arrested. Eichmann's evidence uh, falls mainly on the following, that he was a, a bureaucrat, that he was, or his defense is that he was a bureaucrat, he was following orders, that he's been made a scapegoat for the actions of others, and that he didn't kill anyone directly. By the way, Hausner would write after the trial, he would write, it was extremely strange to hear the devil take an oath in the name of God. Um, the defense wraps up and uh, the four months, four months trial is concluded. The judges rule, first of all, that Israel, the state of Israel, has the standing to try Eichmann and that the state cannot be disconnected from the events of the Holocaust, particularly since half the citizens of the state fled the Nazis either before or after the war. Eichmann is convicted on 15 counts of crimes against the Jewish people and crimes against humanity. He was acquitted on two charges. He was acquitted of membership of the SS. Obviously, he was, he was, a, he was a, a, a member, but it was a technic technicality. And he was also acquitted um, there was no evidence that he himself had directly um, killed uh, any Jews or other people. And Eichmann stated, I did not want to kill. My guilt is only in my obedience, my dutiful service in the time of war. I did not persecute Jews with eagerness and passion. That the government did. I would now like to request the forgiveness of the Jewish people and to confess that I'm ashamed at the memory of what was inflicted on them. I am not the monster that was depicted here. Uh, Eichmann was um, sentenced to death, and the headline on uh, the newspaper Ma'ariv the next day was, do it. Basically, do it, because no one really believed that the state would act. They, they believed that the uh, sentence would be commuted. 
Um, on the immediately after the trial, on the 22nd to the 29th of March 1962, an appeal was made to the Supreme Court, again based by the defense team on arguments against the jury, against the um, Israel, Israel's jurisdiction um, being able to try um, Eichmann. But on the 29th of May, the court upheld the ruling of the lower court. And then a petition for clemency was made to President Yitzhak Bensi. The cabinet sat and a recommendation was made that clemency should not be granted. And on the 31st of May 1962, Eichmann was informed that his appeal for clemency had been rejected. And famously, Bensi, the President Yitzhak Bensi, would write on the document where he would reject the clemency appeal. He would write, the quoting from the book of Samuel, he would write, As thy sword has made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among the women. Eichmann was uh, hung in uh, Akko prison in the early hours of the 1st of January 1962, and his ashes were scattered in the Mediterranean. And the, what were the consequences of the trial? Well, the trial led to a deeper awareness of the impact of Holocaust on survivors, particularly amongst the younger citizens of the straight state, state of Israel. And the trial therefore greatly reduced the, the misconception that Jews had gone like sheep to the slaughter. Hannah Aret was um, a German Jew, a philosopher, who um, she escaped from Germany before the war, and she covered the trial as a reporter for the New Yorker. And after the trial, she would write a very controversial book, which was uh, called Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil, to describe the phenomenon of Eichmann. She, like others, was struck by the very ordinariness and the demeanor he exhibited, and you saw it as a small, slightly balding, bland bureaucrat, in contrast to the horrific crimes he stood, of, he stood accused of. And he was, she wrote, terribly and terrifyingly normal. And she developed a theory of the banality of evil, which was that any normal bureaucrat, any normal person, when put in the state apparatus of evil, could be, um, could basically carry out the um, terrible uh, genocide of the, of the Holocaust. Um, Deborah Lichstadt, who is a Holocaust historian of our day, and um, she um, vehemently rejects Arendt's theories, but she quotes one of the statements that Arendt would make in her book as being the um, best conclusion, the best conclusion to the significance of the Eichmann trial. And she writes, quoting Hannah Arendt, she wrote, the Eichmann trial was the first time since the destruction of the Second Temple, the Jews were able to sit in judgment for crimes committed against Jews and did not need to appeal to the good nature of other nations.